All right, my name's uh, Pat Patterson. I introduced myself earlier, a uh, member at Evans and Dixon, uh, in charge of our, uh, I'm the attorney in charge of our marketing as well. And uh, Evans and Dixon's basically their, their resident redneck. Uh, over here we've got Ron Beretta, a uh, longtime uh, investigator, uh, graduated from the University of uh, Missouri in St. Louis, uh, initially began his work with American Service Bureau, ended up with American Family Insurance for a period of time, and then Easterling and Steinmetz. Since 1981, he's run his own investigative service, Ron R. Beretta and Associates, and a little known fact is that Ron is a ninja. So, we're presenting today basically uh, on hunting and fishing and work comp defense, okay? And uh, one of the reasons we thought we'd wanna talk to you about this is often the individuals uh, that we're dealing with um, are overplaying their complaints, over complaint, overplaying their problems, yet they engage in activities that are inconsistent with that, right? So, you know, we, we know sometimes to look for softball leagues, we know sometimes to look for bowling leagues, pool leagues, uh, varying things like that. Hunting and fishing, sometimes we get a little bit of information on it, maybe we're not really sure what you know what to do with it. So generally what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going through the seasons, pointing out some of the seasons, we're going to be going through some of the equipment that's used in the field, what it requires when they're using that equipment, why it's significant, um, and then records, okay, that can you can obtain or Ron or in your investigative service can obtain for you, what you're looking for in those records, why they're kind of important, etc. Okay, so if at any time you've got a question or uh, want further explanation on anything because we'll go through some of this fairly quickly, okay? Uh, just stop us, all right? All right, starting off, this is a uh, basically a schedule of the seasons in Missouri for hunting and trapping, okay? This can be found at uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation website. These seasons, many of them change every year, so you, can't, you don't necessarily rely on these exact dates, okay? The, the conservation department looks at the harvest records from the previous year. They look at the patterning uh, and, of the animals, and then they, they often will change the dates by a few dates of when a season may begin, when a season may end, okay? These are fishing seasons. For the most part, throughout the state, all fishing is pretty much open uh, on a pretty regular basis, okay? And then, uh, we'll go back to that in a second. Ron, tell us a little bit about how it is in Illinois. Okay, with Illinois, it's pretty much the same thing uh, as far as your season for dove, which is very, very important, is always going to start on September 1st. Okay. Your firearm deer season, which is really the holy grail of hunting in Missouri and Illinois, that will typically be set the first Sad, I'm sorry, the first Friday, Saturday, Sunday prior to Thanksgiving, then it skips and it will start back up about a week and a half later. It'll go Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's your shotgun season. It'll stop again for a few days and then you will have a, uh, fr a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for your muzzleloader season. So it's broken up into three different segments, shotgun, then shotgun combined with muzzle loader, then strictly muzzle loader. Those are the dates you need to keep in mind. And again, that will vary depending on when Thanksgiving falls. Right. Now for Missouri deer season, especially rifle season, as you pointed out, that's the first day, the opening day of deer season is, is like Christmas for a hunter. Okay? They people plan for it for months. They leave their families sometimes for weeks. Okay? But that first day is key. It's, it's, for, for those of us that hunt or fish, spend a lot of time out, outdoors, it, it's a tradition. You know, my uncles are there, my brothers are there, cousins are there for that first day of deer season. And the, and the day before, there's usually a big dinner, a lot of hanging out, telling stories from years past. Everyone goes into the field. At the end of the day, usually another big meal, hanging out, occasionally a little beer, not until we're out of the field, okay? <laughs> Um, but it's a big event, okay? So if you've got someone <clears throat> who is a hunter, you know, and especially if they're a deer hunter, that's a day that's key. And why is it key? Well, one, if you want to put some surveillance on somebody, 
and they're indicating that they can't engage in varying activities, walk around, climb, sit for long periods of time. That's what you gotta do when you're deer hunting, number one. Now, are you gonna be able to get somebody out in the field to, to catch that on, on film? Probably not, and Ron will explain to you a little later why you don't want to, uh, especially if you respect or like your investigator, okay? But the day or two before, the week before, is a key time to put some surveillance on that individual to see are they as incapacitated as they are relaying to you? Because in an effort to get ready for that opening day, they gotta load the truck. They gotta load the camper if they're moving, if they're going someplace far away. This is, you're talking about heavy equipment, you know, often small stoves are, you know, are taken out, uh, cases of beer are loaded up, you know. So there's all th sorts of activity immediately prior to this date, whatever the opening day for deer season is, whether it's in Missouri or Illinois, in which that would be a prime time for you to, to, to put some surveillance on someone. What's another reason? Another reason is, is if you've got a questionable event, an unwitnessed accident, especially soft tissue, of course, all right, and all of a sudden the employer's like, man, there's something wrong here. Nobody saw it. The individual just, you know, reported it, and they didn't come in on Monday. Well, is it the Monday that's right after the opening weekend of deer season? Maybe it is. Okay, and if it is, that's key for me because I'm like, did they ask for time off and you refused it? Were they out of their ETO? Okay, that, that makes you look a little harder at the circumstances, okay? Not only with deer season, but with spring turkey season. Spring turkey season's another holy grail, okay? Every guy that hunts turkey, he wants to be out there the first couple days of turkey season in spring, okay? He's gonna be out walking around, he's gonna be trying to find the birds, he's gonna be sitting under trees, okay? And again, he's gonna prep for that, he's gonna get ready for that. So the weekend before, there's a good chance he's gonna be loading up the truck and loading up the camper, or loading up whatever, and going out to do this. Or he's gonna be trying to get some time off during that spring turkey season, okay? Those are two big ones, all right? Um, Ron mentioned dove. Why is dove so, so key? Uh, it's a, it's a 30 day, I'm sorry, it's a 60 day season, but really after about a week, 90% of the people are done. You birds are migratory, cold weather will drive them out of the area, intense hunting pressure will drive them out of the area. Always look for September 1st. It's a great time for family. It doesn't matter if you got one person or you got five people. Put five, six guys in a 40 acre cut corn field. It's a great social event. Very, very important. You do a lot of shooting, okay? You're shooting like this. You're swinging. You've got a jolt to your shoulder, your upper back, your neck. You're, you're twisting, you're turning, you're constantly scanning around looking for shooting. You might shoot one box, two box, or if you're like Pat, four or five boxes of shells, <laughs> okay? 25 rounds to shoot 15 birds. There's a lot of activity. It's a good time. Circle that date. It's a very important hunting date. The other reason it's a big um, or a key hunting date is, is uh, it's at the end of the summer, okay? Uh, for guys who hunt, even if they fish, hunting's usually they want to get out there. They want to do something, and this is the first season really after a long summer of not being able to kill anything. They can now get out in the field and, and do some do some hunting. Duck and goose follows follows that. Duck and goose again, um, uh, for some people, very big, very important. And if they're passionate about it, they are very passionate about it. Duck and goose is a lot more expensive often than the other types of hunting that we're talking about. Okay, you've got to get your waders, you got to get a place, you got to get blinds. Uh, the shells are more expensive. The guns are heavier. The guns shoot what the, they're, they're different types of rounds. Uh, two and a half inch, which has some, a little bit of a kick, okay? Three inch has a little bit more. For guys who are hunting geese, they're shooting three and a half inch shells, which if you don't have a lot of padding, will literally cause you shoulder injury, uh, much less aggravate one that you've already got. And you're not going to be doing it if you have a shoulder problem. You're not going to be doing it if you have a neck problem, okay? It hurts. It can hurt if you're not doing it right. And again, as Ron pointed out, you've got the activity of swinging the whole way, right, in order to 
shoot properly, not to mention staying in cold water, sitting in cold water, whatever else. All right? Equipment. <clears throat> okay. As you can well imagine, there's a number of different types of equipment um, for each of these uh, different types of sports, hunting or fishing. Shotguns are six to eight pounds in general. Rifles are about the same way. For a rifle, for a muzzleloader, it's a little heavier, right, Ron? Uh, it generally might actually be a little bit a little lighter. lighter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, bows. And then, of course, you've got what you, whatever you harvest in the field, you've got to get out of the field. All right, a, a field dress deer of a medium or small size is probably still weighs, what would you estimate? Oh, you know, if it's a fawn, it might go 50, 60 pounds. That's what the, the gut's out. You right. know, if it's an adult doe, might still be 80 or 90 pounds. You know, if they're a one and a half year old deer, say central Missouri, it's still 100 pounds without okay. the guts inside. And it progressively gets bigger the more farther north you go and the older the deer you have. Okay. And when he says with the guts out, that's what I mean by field dressing, okay? All right? Now, when you're talking to people who hunt deer, or hunt deer, a lot of times what I get in depositions is, well, I went out, but I didn't do anything. I sat, on a, I sat for about an hour. I got lucky. Something walked in front of me. I shot it, you know. Well, did you take care of the deer yourself? Well, I field dressed it and brought it in, but everybody else took care of it after that. Or the alternative is, well, I got my cousins, or my sons did that for me, or my uncle did that for me, okay? Hunters are very prideful individuals. Most of us don't want anybody else touching our stuff, okay? If we killed it, point of pride is we're going to take care of it. Point of pride is we're going to eat it, okay? At a bare minimum, just about anybody who goes into the field that shoots a turkey or shoots a deer is, is at a bare minimum is going to field dress it, okay? Field dressing requires you to... Spread the legs on the animal, cut it up the middle, manage to pour the guts out. It's a very arduous, it's a very difficult process. If you're by yourself, it's tough. With two people, it's still difficult, okay? If you're involved in any portion of that, you're bending, squatting, you're dealing with a lot of weight at a very awkward positions. And okay? it's dead weight. And it's dead weight, which is anybody that's had, tried to pick up a sleeping child that weighs 30 pounds, when they're completely done, knows how, diff how heavy that can become, right? All right. All right, this is some of the just examples for those of you who may not have seen a lot of this, okay? Many of you are nodding your heads, so you either know hunters or have been involved in this type of stuff, okay? But either way, you know, this is your standard rifle up here, okay? Most of these are shotguns over here. This muzzle loader down here, okay? You'll have guys tell you, well, I'm, I'm using a crossbow, okay? And many of the doctors, if someone has a shoulder injury, a neck injury, they can easily get a license to use a crossbow, okay? A crossbow means you don't have to draw it yourself at the time you're going to shoot it. It's pre-drawn, okay? You put in a bolt instead of an arrow. It's called a bolt. And then you shoot it basically like a, um, like a rifle, okay? Uh, the problem, or... The thing is, is that with many crossbows, there's still quite a bit of effort that has to go into cocking the crossbow. Some of them can be cranked back, all right, to pull it back. Others, you actually have a, a lever in which you put the, uh, the bow on the ground and you pull it back until the, uh, the string gets caught, and then you put in your bolt and you go from there, okay? You've got different types of bows, long bow, not very many people use those, although some retroactives Hunters, old schools are trying to get back to them. Recurve, getting a little bit more common when we were younger. This was really what, what most people used. And then once you got a few dollars in your pocket, you bought your compound, um, compound bow. All right, all of them have a draw weight. It's called a draw weight. Basically, if you took away 25 pounds, held the bow up here. If it was a 25 pound draw, it would slowly bend the, the bow. Okay, so it's a draw weight. All right. If you're shooting either one of these, it's 25 pounds from when you start until you finish, and you hold it at 25 pounds until you release it, okay? And most of these, if you're going deer hunting, okay, you're not using a 25-pound draw weight. You're probably using at a minimum 40, likely 45. Some guys go up to 65. If you go hunting elk, anything like that, you might go as high as an 80-pound draw weight, okay? The compound's a little bit different because it has a breakdown. Okay, so what happens is after you pull it a certain weight or a certain 
to a certain point, it breaks down to a much easier hold, okay? The little levers make it easier to hold it. So the draw weight, once you get it all the way back, may only be 25 pounds, but you still start at 65 or 70, okay? And it's once you get it a certain distance, does it break down to that 25? And the reason you do that is because uh, it's easier to hold. It's easier to aim. You can be steadier if you're only holding 25 pounds back as opposed to if you're holding 80 or what, 65, okay? But again, it takes quite a bit, of, still takes effort from the beginning when it, you know, from, from when you start with it, right? Anything else on the uh, rifles, shotguns, or bows? Uh, when you practice, the reason I keep sitting down, I've got a bulging disc in my back, so when I stand for any length of time, you know, Pat's gonna have to pick me off the floor. When you, or engage in the outdoors, especially deer hunting, you typically will practice with your firearm to make sure that it's zeroed in so that you can humanely take an animal. You may shoot two or three times, you may shoot a box of shells, but again, you're talking in Illinois, either a muzzle-loading rifle or a shotgun. You're not gonna use a high-powered rifle in Illinois. You use it in Missouri, you can use a shotgun, high-powered rifle or muzzle-loader it delivers a big jolt to your shoulder. So that's something to keep in mind, again, with a shoulder, neck, or upper back injury. Right. And anybody that goes archery hunting, um, usually, or should, okay, spend weeks practicing before any season starts at various angles. Up high, kneeling, sitting down low, varying distances. If you go to many of the local parks, they now have archery ranges in there. You'll see these guys out there in August preparing for the season, okay? Um, so it takes a lot of time, a lot of practice uh, to, to be proficient, to have any type of success, all right? These are some of the uh, some additional qu equipment that you'll see out in the field, um, and all of them require, obviously, certain amounts of effort, a certain amount of time put into preparing them, getting them ready. Um, you know, uh, this stand here, fairly common. Okay, but in an effort to use that stand, you have to go out into the field several weeks so, or months, preferably months beforehand, find the appropriate place for it, okay, clear everything off the tree so you can put it up appropriately, okay, then put, put it together, which requires a ladder on the side of the tree, you hauling that up there, cinching it in, and then slowly working down and tightening everything up until it's a functioning uh, piece of work. So. Again, if you're asking questions from people, well, what kind of stand do you hunt out of? Do you hunt out of a standing or standing stand? Do you hunt out of a, this is a ground blind? Do you hunt out of a climbing stand? Ron, tell them about a climbing stand. That is a lot of work. You're talking about roughly 25 pounds of steel. And it, if you've ever watched a hunting program on television, trust me, it is not like on television, okay? You're using your hips, your legs, your back, and you're inching your way up a tree, and you're probably getting up there 12 to 15 feet, and you're moving steel the whole time. You're stretching your arms. There's a lot of work. Yeah, there's a lot, there, a lot of work. Us wise hunters either use these <laughs> or these, okay? Those are the two safest, uh, but again, as you can see, this still requires a lot of effort, although these can be up for years and years and years. These move around a little bit more. This one obviously can be moved a lot more. Um, and then you have, um, these are carts. That's to take your deer out of the field. Not many people actually use them, okay? Most people drag them out themselves or get a buddy to grab them and they haul them out themselves and then haul them up into a pickup truck and then drive the pickup truck to wherever they're ultimately gonna clean the deer, which is take the skin off of it, debone it, et cetera and so on. Yeah, when, one thing you might, when run your motor vehicle records and you run them on the plaintiff and you run it on members of his household, okay? If you've got an ATV, you're riding, you're not riding in a park, you're riding on rough terrain, you're bouncing along, you're shifting, you're braking, and again, it's a bumpy ride, and you're doing this most of the time. You're going into the woods when it's dark, you're coming out in the evening when it's dark. These are things to consider because it is a rough ride, and this is what you haul your deer in if you're lucky. Yeah. All right, going into the field, 
All right. Um, obviously, there are no, a number of activities that you have to gauge, engage in to go out into the field either to fish, to uh, duck hunt, deer hunt, or whatever. And as he pointed out, when you go into a field, you know, you'll have individuals say, yeah, I went out. I just walked across this field maybe 50 yards, and then I sat down. Okay? These fields don't look like this. All right? All right? They're not golf courses. They're not cut grass level things. They're, they're plowed fields that might be grown up. Okay? It's, it's uneven ground. It's not a comfortable walk. As you get older, it gets less and less comfortable. Okay? So something to keep in, uh, to keep in mind. Don't trust them on that, for one thing. Okay? Foot fishing, fly fishing. Okay? Obviously, this demonstrates some of the, ac the action that's required for fly fishing. Okay? But even if, if you're not fly fishing, even if you're bait casting, I mean, it's a constant throw of your arm. Okay? You're waiting okay, on slippery rocks, on, ro on gravel that gives way. Okay? Uh, you may be wearing waders. Okay? All of this is cumbersome. All of this is awkward. All of this puts your body in, in odd positions. Okay? And um, so it's, you know, just something to know. The same, same way with the deer hunting, okay? You're walking often up and down hills, into ravines, across rugged terrain to get to where you're going. Turkey hunting. Oh, <laughs> tell them about the I turkey. just, you know, when we get into the tags, you'll see my turkey hunting disease, okay? Even though you're not lugging a lot of gear, you're still carrying a shotgun, seven, eight pounds. You got a couple of boxes, or you got four or five shells with you. And you're, you're going again in very dark. We're typically out in the woods at about 515 in the morning. Again, you're walking on uneven terrain. You're walking through the woods. It's not a walk in the park, okay? I wish I had a dollar for every time I fell going into the woods. Falling out of a tree a few times, okay? Those are things you got to watch out for. And you can't be moving. You're tense, your back's up against a tree, and it is actually, even though you're sitting, it is still very tiring. Plus, you're walking in boots. Boots are a lot heavier than your, uh, your tennis shoes. These are all little tiny building blocks that you all might want to keep in mind. Duck and goose hunting requires often for you to, to wade into uh, flood, either flooded timber in which case you're often standing in flooded timber waiting for the uh, ducks to come in, wading, in, wading into flooded fields, okay, which require waders, which are, again, very awkward, very heavy. Um, the turkey hunting, again, you're camouflaged from head to toe, and that may be relevant to a particular case. The other thing to keep in mind is if someone is indicating they've got cognitive issues, that they've been hit in the head, bright lights or loud noises bother them, it's going to be pretty tough to do deer or turkey hunting or anything along those lines, duck or goose hunting, because often duck and goose hunting, you're in a blind or with several other individuals who are firing off weapons at the same time you're firing off weapons, and even somebody without issues can leave the field with issues. Oops. Licenses. This is probably one of the more key aspects of what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, What do they look like? Where are they purchased, the significance? Ron, tell them a little bit about what information you can get and how you get it. it it's a gold mine of information, okay? When you look, uh, when you get your report from the Missouri Department of Conservation, first of all, order it before you think you really need it because you want it certified and you want to actually get that license for one or two years prior to the claim date because they're going to say, I used to deer hunt, I used to fish, I used to do this. You want to show that one and two years prior to the claim date, either they did or they did not. If they did not have those tags, they said they did, you caught them in a lie. If you're lying about that, what else are you lying about? You want those certified because you want to be able to admit that into a work comp hearing are into evidence at a civil trial. You want hunting records, you want the fishing records, you want big game tags. And when I'm talking about Missouri and Illinois, big game are deer and turkey, and you want the big game harvest record because by law you have to check in a deer, you have to check in a turkey either by telephone or by computer. 
that's what you're looking at. Now these are certified, that's a certification letter, the one that was right in front of it. Again, this is a, like a $10 record search and it's irrefutable information that has been provided by the Conservation Commission. It's there and they got the information from your claimant. Can you get it in Illinois? You can do it in Illinois. All you have to do with Illinois, and that is one thing that Illinois is actually better than Missouri. You can go on to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources online. You can go to their website, go to the Freedom of Information request. You can fill out the record request online. There's a box, do you want it certified? Yes. And you tell them, I want hunting, fishing, big game, and big game harvest records from 2011 up to the present time. Three or four days later, it comes to you free of charge. That's a great bargain. It's very fast. It takes you five or 10 minutes. Don't overlook that. If you're a crazy person like me, what time I have, I'm in the woods. I would hunt in Missouri and I hunt in Illinois. I wouldn't miss it for the world. It's great record search. How about Kansas and Iowa? Do you know anything about uh, Kansas or Iowa? I don't. Do you know Missouri and Illinois. If I took it in another state, you'd right. be drawing me in chalk. Yeah, okay. Um, two two uh, points I'd like to, to work off. First and foremost, it's important to check because a lot of times what do we get? Well, you know, traditionally what we get, well, I used to play baseball with my son and now I don't play baseball. And did you play baseball with your son up until the time of this event? Yeah, I played baseball up until the time of this event. Okay, well, it's often difficult to disprove that or, or to prove it. But if they're telling you, well, I used to fish, but I can't fish anymore, or I used to hunt, but I can't fish anymore. So as of the date of this event, you haven't hunt, hunted anymore, and you haven't fished anymore. No, but you did before that. Oh, yeah, I was out there all the time, out there all the time. You pull these records, it's as important as he pointed out if there's nothing there in the two or three years before. That tells you, you know, maybe on a permanent total case, maybe they had issues before and they stopped hunting and fishing back when they had a prior medical condition or prior injury. Or, or second, that they're lying to you. They're playing, you know, they're puffing up their case, trying to make it look worse by saying they gave up an outside activity. You know, the guys that tell you, oh, I can't play golf anymore. About well, you hadn't played golf for five years, okay? So it's not just what you can get, but what you can show wasn't there either, okay? Now, when we look at these records, these are kind of these are kind of interesting. All right, these are your permit numbers. That helps you just track who the hunter is and what he's doing. All right, right here is a description of what was purchased. Right, so you got a you got a hardcore guy here. All right, because you can see every year he's he's purchasing multiple licenses. Right, he's getting his resident hunting and fishing. Okay, you got to have that just to carry a gun or put a pole in the water, except on private ponds for the fishing, et cetera, and so on. But you still have to have your resident hunting and fishing, your hunting for any hunting anywhere, for them, except for on private farms, but I won't go into it. When I mean private, I mean commercial private. Uh, resident spring turkey, so he got out early in the season there. Resident firearm deer hunting. Then he went to a resident managed deer hunting, okay? And then he went to resident firearm antlerless deer, okay? Now there's several things that could occur here. He may have not killed anything here, so he went there. So he may not have killed anything there, so he went there. Or he may have killed three deer in one season, okay? All right, so that'll tell you what, what all they're getting, okay? Then when you come over here to the vendor, all right, you say, well, what's the significance? What's the significance of where he purchased his license? What do I care where he purchased his license? What's that tell me, right? Okay, say this guy lives down in Sykeston, Missouri but he purchases his licenses in Campbell County, which is up near the Iowa border, all right? He's telling you in the medical records, he's telling the doctors, I can't drive 100 miles. I can't drive 50 miles without getting out, you know? Or I hunted in my backfield, I didn't go anywhere. Or, you know, I fish in my pond behind the house, I don't go anywhere. Really, well, why did you purchase your fishing license at the Lake of the Ozarks? You drove down the Lake of the Ozarks, you know, to to purchase a fishing license and then drove home? Well, one, you said you couldn't drive 100 miles. And two, you're not just fishing in your pond behind you, <laughs> okay? He's going places to fish, right? And you see that on a pretty regular basis. Guys will tell me in deposition or when I'm speaking with a, a claimant on something that, well, you know, I kept it local, I didn't do much of anything, okay? Somebody from Sykeston, Missouri, who hunts along the Iowa border, and a lot of guys will drive up to the Iowa border 
to, to hunt because there are larger deer up there, okay? They're not going to do that and only spend an hour in the field. They're not going to walk across the field, you know, sit down for an hour and come back and then drive all the way back down to Sykeston, okay? So that can, again, give you additional inconsistencies of what's going on. The other thing that when you get to date and time, maybe what can be of significance there? Well, uh, let's see, 2013, where is it? Oh, no, 2014, right here. Purchased his first license on November 1st, 2014, okay? So again, a lot of what a guy, guys will tell you, well, I purchased my license. I just go out to have some fun with the guys. I don't really hunt. I just show up. I drink a few beers around the campfire, throw some stories. Those guys go out into the field. I wait around for them. They come back because i got to lay on the cot for a while because my back's killing me. So I don't really hunt. Well, then why did you go purchase this one on November 24th, 2014? Okay, you went out and bought a second license. Why would anybody do that if all you're doing is just going out for camaraderie? You're not going to, okay? That's somebody who's out there and is actively hunting. Plus, it can you, can, you can check and see, okay, um, look at the doctor's records. Did you see a significant change in the medical condition between dates or around those dates or during those seasons? Were they going along just fine through October and then deer season hit and they bought a deer license? And all of a sudden, they've got really bad issues, and now radiating complaint they didn't have, complaints they had, didn't have before. Gives you, gives you stuff to look at. Tell them a little bit about the, uh, the harvest records there. Okay, this is very telling, too. All right, turkey hunting is not simply going out, sitting behind a tree, and keep your fingers crossed. It is the most challenging hunting you'll ever do in Missouri. All right, you take a look, turkey killed this year, this year, this year, and uh, I got this uh, records in March and uh, killed a turkey last week, all right? It tells you you're hardcore. When you see a guy who is waterfowl hunting, a guy who is deer hunting, and a guy or gal who is turkey hunting, those are your major sports, all right? And what also is telling here, on this one tag of managed deer hunt, that's actually another deer season. It's very hard to get picked for those, but you can see here we hunted during a regular deer season. We got it picked for the managed deer season. Another season, keep that in mind. When you look over here at the kill dates for the deer, okay, the deer here was taken 1125. That was taken during the antlerless season. So that means I hunted during the regular season, I didn't kill a buck, but I did hunt after the regular season, during the antler season, and took one, okay? This deer here, when was that taken? December 21st. Is it colder? It's not a walk in a brisk fall day. You're right in the heart of winter. That was taken with a muzzle loader. So you've got a deer guy hunting during the regular season, then he drops down to the antlerless season, and then a month and a half later, he's killing deer at the tail end of December. Add that with your uh, managed deer hunt, and you got a guy who uh, really likes to do it, and it's hard. One thing that's interesting on this turkey from last year, okay, I killed that bird on May 4th. May 2nd, I was along Highway 70 waiting for the highway patrol. I got hit by a tractor trailer, okay? My bulging disc is not related to that, but I'm beat up, I'm sore. Two days later, I'm in the woods and I'm killing a turkey. Hunting is a very obsessive sport. It's, 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 people love it, and uh, it, it's something that should, shouldn't be overlooked because so many of your claimants work comp, personal injury. They're male, they're blue collar, living in small towns, rural areas, suburban areas. Those are the kind of guys that you want to look. And keep in mind, when you all run like data bank searches, like Accurant, TLO, those data bank searches do not show you deer permits. They don't show you turkey permits. They don't show you, show you trout stamps. They don't show you migratory bird. And it will probably come as a big surprise to you. In Missouri, if you deer hunt, you don't need a hunting license. You have to have a deer permit. In Illinois, if you hunt deer, you have to have a hunting license. But in Missouri, 
You have to have a deer permit, but not a hunting license. That's where your data bank records fall way, way short. And hunters are very proud of what they take. So they usually will call them in. Uh, you used to have to take it to a check station. Sometimes people go there, sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they'd go there because they had the best looking deer they thought. And so they were happy to take it. They switched it several years ago where you got, actually it's an honor system, you call it in yourself. Okay, uh, you got to tag it, you know, make sure you keep your tag with your meat, things like that, okay. But they're pretty prideful, so they're, they're, they're normally going to call in what they've killed if they've done it. Also, Facebook, et cetera, and so on, they'll just be displaying that. And you can get really good information about, you know, when they killed it, what it looked like, they're holding up the head on it, they're holding the turkey out to the side, whatever it is, okay. So that's a good look. Now, when it comes to investigative investigation and you're using your investigators, okay, there are some concerns. And our resident expert, oh, whoops, it's fast. There we go. Okay. Don't let somebody say we're going to go out in the woods and get video of your guy or gal deer hunting. It's not going to happen, okay? Uh, we've gone out there and followed people up to the first gravel road, but when it's 4.30 in the morning, you're not going to be taking twist and turn around, you know, 10 more miles of country road without burning that claim. It's not going to happen. In 2002, I wrote an article with PI Magazine and uh, two investigators were in a rural surveillance in Illinois, in Perry County. The guy was on 80 acres. They took video of him. It's a railroad case. The attorney for the other side got the video, filed a lawsuit against the two investigators and their client for invasion of privacy and for trespass. The judge was going to allow punitive damages. The case was settled for $135,000, and that was in 2002. Right now, there is a lawsuit. Actually, there's two lawsuits pending in Missouri, one involving a rural route surveillance on a work comp case, uh, allegations of invasion of privacy and trespass. That has brought in two investigators, investigative agency, an insurance adjuster, insurance company, third-party insurance administrator, and the holding company owning the insurance company. You cannot take shortcuts when it comes to preparing for these cases. Don't trespass. And if somebody said, we're going to go out in the woods and get them, ask them, how are you going to do that and stay within legal bounds? Missouri is an absolute liability state. It does not have to be posted for, our, for that land to, be, uh, uh, to constitute trespass. In Illinois, you can't do it. You can look all over that farm and not see a no trespassing sign. You post it by publication, that's good. You're still in trouble. So keep that in mind. Stay out of the woods, stay out of trouble. What about easements? All right, th that's, that's a fiction. Okay, uh, in my briefcase there, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you some articles if you're interested. A, a, an easement is between a utility company and a property owner. I did a lot of research for this uh, back in 2002, 2003 when I wrote for PI Magazine. That allows a utility company to come on to that owner's, landowner's property to do what they need to do to keep the power lines free and clear. That is not a green light for somebody to come in there and trespass. That right away is private property. You can't be on that property. That's the bottom line. Now, if you're walking by, nobody's going to say anything. But if you're going to sit there and do surveillance on the right of way, you're still going to get in trouble. You don't want your case being the crash test dummy. The crash test dummy died in Perry County in 2002. The crash test dummy will be buried in Missouri, possibly in October of 2015 on the other trespass case. Stay out of the woods, stay out of trouble. Again, these people are also armed. Now, despite the fact, or just for warning there, a couple weeks ago I decided to put my own surveillance on a particular individual. And probably exceeded the <laughs> boundaries, but we did get this. <laughs> That's our speaker right there, with at least one of his turkeys. I hope one he did check this year. I did. All right. Uh, that pretty much concludes what we've got. Uh, 
the outline is in your book. Does anyone have any questions for Ron or so? Yes. Um, I stepped out a bit, so I apologize if this was answered. But I, I've taken depositions a couple times where the folks say that they're hunting, and then there's nothing that comes up on the check. And I'm wondering what, how often do folks either use someone else's tag or don't do it at all um, to report their their harvest and such. Well, as far as just in Missouri buying a general hunting and fishing license, uh, you you purchase a license for fishing separate, but cost is the minimus. Um, so they'll, they'll often buy the license. Uh, as far as the tags go, um, some people get them as gifts every year, some, do, some people purchase them every year. Uh, there's a lot of unlucky hunters out there that may not should. Did you see the harvest records? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of unlucky hunters. I mean, if you look at my harvest records for 2014, they were abysmal. Um, uh, there's not a lot of using children sometimes, like my son, is tagged a deer under one of my license or one of my tags uh, because he killed one in youth and went to hunt again during regular season. So, but generally, you keep you your own. You keep your own. Okay. Right. Would you agree with that, Ron? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, now they changed the law a little bit, but up until like this last year, in much of Missouri, if you wanted to shoot. Two, four, five, ten antlerless deer being does or first year fawns. You could in Lincoln County where I hunt. If I wanted to shoot five antlerless deer, put the money down. So it doesn't make sense. I did it to fill out a tag for your buddy. Okay, that is a weak argument. In other words, if we go with it, so it's okay to lie. Right. Okay. You're so committing you a state violation. Building. Right. What, what about, I, I've taken depositions a couple times where the folks talk about how they, he and a bunch of buddies have what sounds like an impromptu hunter's club where they've got a piece of land that they all share and, and the way they're deeded is very confusing. Um, what is your experience with that and what's really going on? Up on the they always say, oh, my buddies help me. Get the, yeah, we did, we did discuss that briefly. First and foremost, many leases, uh, like it's in Missouri, there's not a lot of people that hunt on, on public property, at least in my experience, on the eastern half of the state. It's a little more prominent on the western half of the state where there's more prairie up there, and that's mostly upland birds and stuff like that. But um, either you, most people either have their own place that they, they can hunt, they, they ask for permission from uh, farmers that they that become acquainted, with the hunt, but in your circumstance when you're talking about lease property, depending on where the lease property is, uh, it can be a very expensive proposition, uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks up to 500 bucks a hunter, depending on how much acreage and how much exclusivity you get with your, with your lease, okay? And so for someone to advise you that, hey, you know, for, for grins, uh, I threw in with these guys, um, it's usually not very common. Now to determine what exactly what it was or whether be, they would be willing to volunteer who they leased that property from so you could ask yourself what the charge was and how many people were supposed to be out there. It's very, that's very difficult. I, anybody who hunts, you find it really hard to believe that you're going to invest that money unless your butt's going to be out there with the police. You're just not going to do it. And, and, and as I pointed out earlier, I don't buy the people that say, Oh, I went out and, and you know, I got up with everybody, had breakfast, they went out to the field, I walked 50 yards, <laughs> sat on a milk crate, and then I came back. And again, that's why when you look at those records and you see, okay, where did they go to hunt? Where did they purchase their license? It makes it even less credible, longer distances, and different things like and, that. And you ever had success, I have not ever had success getting from the Department of Conservation the paperwork behind a method exemption where they can, you know, the, the permission to use a mechanized crossbow or something like that. I have, you know, it has to come with a doctor's statement, and I've always tried to get the, the doctor's statement as to why that was, and I, so far, have never been able to get one out of the Department of Conservation. I don't think the Conservation Commission is going to give it to you, because like, like years ago, uh, we used to be able to get driver's license data card, which on page two would describe in detail any notable physical disability that would affect your ability to drive a car. About four or five, six years ago, they said that's a medical question right. and you're no longer allowed. 
I think that's the same thing you're faced with Missouri Department of Conservation. I might try to see if I can get one. You might try to subpoena it for that, but I mean, that, the individual should know which physician actually prescribed her. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've been do, trying to get these for a long time. I can never really get the pieces to come together with what that doctor said is the reason, what that form he filled out was, and what the Department of Conservation has on file. It's a guy's you know, left shoulder. If somehow it's not in the doctor's notes, and yet this guy's got the method exemption. And, it would be nice to you know why. Yeah, I, you know, I, even in the medical records, I would anticipate that in a lot of local or, or smaller communities where with the, uh, you know, hometown doctors or whatever, the, what's the time to why they, anybody can go get one. I can go get one. I, I can all I have to do is walk to the doctor's office and say, I'm really at the bottom of shoulder. I can't really do this. Will you give me one for a crossbow? And, and that also can include hunting from your car, is that right? No. 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 Isn't there an, an exemption to hunt from your car? No. no. Not that I'm aware of. There is in South Dakota. Okay. There is in South Dakota, right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of any in uh, Missouri. I, I'm not aware of any. Unless my father to take some privilege or something yeah. <laughs> on his own property. But, uh, that's about it. Yeah. And, uh, that's so they say they're hunting from their car, they're not telling the no. truth. There, there. I've heard it out in Wyoming, okay, and there you can only feel like, you know, a couple feet off the road because, you know, it's, it's such a vast area and uh, the laws are a little bit different, but, you know, you can't be shooting from a public road, you can't be shooting from a car, not in Missouri, absolutely not. In fact, they even have, occasionally they have a sting operation to have mechanical deer where people will shoot, you have know, the decoy and they'll get arrested. And you know the real dumb ones when they shoot <laughs> yeah, I talked to a conservation guy who I know, and uh, they had a guy video who we know, and he shot a dummy deer 12 times. Oh, uh, <laughs> kept reloading. <laughs> they had a lot of fun. That's an IQ test at that point. It's <laughs> not a physical test. So, yeah. I have a, a case right now of an injured employee. Um, he's no longer working with us, but he's going for perm total. Um, and I know that he recently went on a hog hunt in Texas, mm -hmm. um, and that's Bo. When you purchase an out-of-state license, you have to, do you have to purchase that from Texas yes. itself? Yeah, Is there anything from Missouri that you have to apply for before you can? You can apply. I hunt in Missouri, and I hunt in Illinois, uh -huh. okay? In Missouri, you know, I can go get a tag over the counter. In Illinois, you have to actually apply, and then we're put in the second drawn because we're not residents. I would think with the hog situation in Texas, you could probably. It's private, yeah, it's private land. Yeah, and, and, but they want you down They there. want them, yes, yeah, they absolutely. do. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I have this picture on Facebook with his bow and his hog, so I know that he killed it. Yes, right. yeah, he's not gonna pose with somebody else's deer unless it's his, you know, his mm -hmm. son. But you all might, Texas is a good record state. You can probably contact the Department of Natural Resources and for a few dollars get certified records of that. And if he's hunting hogs, if he's a bow hunter, he may be hunting in Missouri. We all from oh, Missouri. Yeah, he's hunt. Yeah, I know he's hunting. So, okay, um, get those records and again, get them early and get them certified. All right. There's probably some restrictions on moving that meat as well. There could be. Yeah. So yeah, the Texas record would, would probably a lot of states if you. If you go out west and you shoot a, uh, an elk or uh, a deer at a certain time, they require that it be processed in that state and you have that special uh, permits to even bring it back. Uh, certain blood borne diseases, so you, you, know, you can't uh, transfer the raw carcass. You have to have a process there. So, yeah. If a landowner gives uh, notice of no trespass by publication, do they have to do that every so often or just once? Or? I'm sorry, we're out of time. All right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what state. Okay. In, in, in the, our, we had a farm that was in Illinois. I don't know how often my cousin posted it. All right. But when we're talking about Missouri, Missouri is an absolute liability state. So, you know, you're in trouble when you go on that property. You can also post it by signs. You can also paint, post it by purple paint, you know, along the property line. 
But again, just because you can't see no trespassing signs, you don't see purple paint, it's not a great life for you to go on that property. Yeah? Um, I hate to be difficult, but in the state of Missouri, you can get a hunting method exemption, position statement of eligibility to hunt from your car, stationary wow. vehicle. That's no, part no. one and part two is the crossbow, the mechanized crossbow. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Now, I would still suggest that when you say that, it does not mean you can still come from a public road from the right. but from You but can, you can take it on a private property and, and shoot out of the vehicle yeah. uh, on the private property. But if I get that record showing he's got an exemption to hunt from his car, that means there's probably something wrong with physically. I would, if he's I would hope, yeah. The state saying he can hunt from his car. Okay, anything else? Otherwise, we are at the end of our time. Thank you.